So um, the first thing is, uh, I'm not a phonologist, nobody suspects me of being a, a phonologist, and therefore I need uh, correction after my talk. <laughs> so the discussion will, be, will take the form of instructing me on my uh, mistakes. Um, secondly, I would like to uh, suggest that um, the uh, old Chinese uh, is described in great detail in two works that are missing in, um, uh, in the uh, a new reconstruction. Uh, I believe that Hua Xue Cheng, Zhou Qin Han Jin Fang Yan, Yan Jiu Shi, is a uniquely rich. Uh, a semblance of all the material that should have been uh, considered, I think. Um, and this book would be by far the most uh, rich source for it. Even more striking is, uh, but of course not available for at the time of writing the new reconstruction, is Wang Zhiping. This is an extraordinary thing which I recently uh, uh, received of terrific interest. So it is Chu Tu Wen Xian Yu Xian Jin Liang Han Fang Yan Di. That is a very uh, coming, uh, a thing which then goes systematically beyond Hua Xue Cheng, who is a student of uh, our good friend uh, Lu Guoyao. And Lu Guoyao has written a terrifically useful summary of Hua Xue Cheng's um, <coughs> findings that I find uh, in itself is a, a small monographic contribution and an introduction to this work. Um, so um, uh, Wang Zhuping says, Liang Han Shi Qi Po Duo Da Gui Mu Ren Ko Jian Xi Wen Hua Jiao Liu Pin Fan Yo Zi Xing Cheng De Yu Yan Jie Chu this, I think, is, puts my point, you know, I don't have more to say, and I think that more of this kind of material might have been, you know, recommended to readers, if not used in the book, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, then um, we have a Fang Yen, uh, which is uh, even by my teacher and friend uh, Lu Guoyao, uh, who wrote extensively on it, uh, interpreted as a local language and so on, mm, as I understand him. And I think that is a, a misreading of the ancient Chinese. Uh, Fang Yu <laughs> does exist also and would be a language, and Fang Yen are actually local words, and Fang Yen is therefore a list of words and not a description of a language. Uh, I say probably, you see, I have discussed it with uh, many of our uh, linguist colleagues, and there is actually a, a very general suspicion that we have read new Fang Yen into old Fang Yen in two wrong ways. One is not anymore current, which is to simply say Fang Yen in ancient Chinese is, uh, uh, is a dialect, which it is not, this local language. But that local language itself is again a mistake, because it has language which would be Yu and not uh, Yen. So that is an idea which may be wrong but so um, we now have uh, some other issues here. I have two indispensable works on morphology, which I think if we look at uh, what we are told about derivation by tone change or by S addition suffixation, if that is the solution we want to subscribe to that everybody shares, then Sun Yu Wen uh, and especially Xie Wei Wei, uh, Han Yu Yin Bian Go Zi Yan Jiu, you know, are a wealth of material that should have been, uh, I think, could have 
uh, greatly changed the description of S suffixation in classical Chinese, I must say. I mean, uh, I have studied this for decades. I learned a furious amount from these books and, uh, because these uh, were uh, theses by students. Uh, Sun Nguyen actually got many prizes uh, for this book. And I think that uh, uh, Xia Weiwei richly deserves similar prizes uh, for his uh, thesis. These are two young uh, scholars. I don't think they're more than much more than 30 or something, you know, and I think they're doing excellent work. And I'm just <laughs> trying to be useful. I, you know, it, I think it would help to, uh, take, to at least remind the readers of um, our new reconstruction that there are these works that tell a great deal more about S suffixation than uh, is in the book. Then um, there is um, a very nice uh, statement by uh, uh, Zhang Xinhu. You see Zhang Xinhu, Gu Ren Wu Yun Shu, the Shi Zhu Yun, Ge Sui Qi Fang Yin, or Shu Yin. They each follow the Fang Yin, and I miss the expression Fang Yin in uh, the new reconstruction because I think it is uh, correct, as Lin Yu Tang learned from uh, August Conradi in Leipzig when he wrote his thesis there that the phenomenon of well, yes, uh, the the phenomenon of um, Fang Yin, local uh, variant um, pronunciation, is crucial for uh, the uh, kind of unneedness that was mentioned a moment ago <laughs> in the rhyming. Um, and of course, Lin Yutang in his uh, Lun Wenji, Yuan Xue uh, Lun Wenji, has, I think, five or six uh, important articles on Fang Yin Xue. Um, so uh, I won't bother you anymore with this. I think it's just useful to remember, <laughs> to, to my mind, it is useful to remember that there is this extensive research on Fang Yin as opposed to Fang Yen, which might have been brought to bear. Uh, there is a question I have on the ter very term reconstruction. Uh, Wang Li prefers to be nice and he uses nice ni tse. Literally, uh, draft guess to Chung Jian. And I just want to, since he's a colleague of mine in Beda and so on, and I've known him and so on, it is very interesting that he sounds very uh, dogmatic, but in fact, mm, I did, uh, have forgotten to put in the quotation. But he puts very explicitly, <coughs> he rejects the term chung jian um, and dislikes it and prefers ni tse and thinks that it is, um, if you are thinking of your things as hypotheses, it's a very good idea to call them that. Um, you see, <laughs> to, to, to use a terminology that does not uh, have this kind of way. I found uh, Wang Li's comments here really rather moving. <laughs> you see, because he really felt that ni and ce, yes, you see, yes, unfortunately, in a language like Chinese, with the kind of data we have, we cannot move much beyond this, is his uh, thought. Um, the next point I have is uh, that um, Middle Chinese is said to be. Um, Reconst uh, to be transcribed, and I think um, that Egerod already in 55 uh, put it bluntly and correctly, only the modern dialect will provide material for reconstructing actual values for many elements such as initial and so on and so on. This is uncontroversial and moreover, the, uh, what we reconstruct depends on what dialects we look at. Um, and on many, many other things, especially, of course, a very long history of uh, reconstruction of Middle Chinese that we can trace. Uh, even Shakespeare's pronunciation was reconstructed. Uh, I was going to carry to you uh, Helge Köckeritz's 
Shakespeare's pronunciation. I warmly recommend that if you, if you are going to speak of the philosophy of rhyming, please read this book of the great professor of Yale, uh, Helge Kückeritz. He became very famous in Shakespeare studies. This is a classic. It's a very beautiful book. I wish I had taken it. So there you get problematization of, for example, computability of what rhymes and what doesn't rhyme. You see, of course, rejected because of the conventional nature of uh, rhyming uh, conventions that are cultural and uh, that can actually link uh, very distant things, as was mentioned a moment ago, and as is very common in German and so on. So I'm just mentioning, I hope you don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying this should have been in the book, but I am saying that we would be talking, bet, making better sense about the problems of rhyming in literature if we had in the backs of our minds this fantastically readable book. It is uh, riveting. I'm not a phonologist, and I have read large swathes of this book with great pleasure. And so there it is. Uh, the very substantial um, evidence there is for performing his reconstruction has been found radically insufficient for the task. So no magic formula exists by means of which we can single out I rhymes in Shakespeare. That's a harsh statement. And I assure you, we have lots and lots of books about the pronunciation at the time, and still we cannot in literature be sure. Now, I assure you that we could discuss rhyming in uh, Shizhi um, at a much of a better level if we uh, actually have a commonly reading books of this order, and if we used one Xian Shi Jing uh, Yunpu, which of course is uh, 2000 and two or something, and which gives you the 249 rhyme scheme schemes in Shi Jing and so on, and has a remark which I find very helpful. Um, it would take more than his 500 page book to justify ascription of rhymes in each case, because it is in fact a literary decision also. It is a philological decision, it is not a computational matter. Uh, so that is what he thinks, and I must say, I, I just uh, do, uh, permit myself to agree. Uh, so um, the Middle Chinese transcription in the new reconstruction, basically the same as in Bill's, explicitly replaces Cargren's phonetic reconstruction with an attempt as phonological reconstruction. I will come back to that. Um, uh, take uh, Xian first and Xian Immortal, uh, where Bill, uh, by the way, has my sympathy <laughs> for uh, not uh, respecting uh, Cargren's eh, uh, eh, um, opposition. And um, this is an explicit refusal in the new reconstruction to transcribe what Lu Fa Yen tried to register in the spirit of the famous dictum which goes like this, po xi hao li fen bie, and then shu lei, don't ask me. <laughs> but it does mean uh, what I here say, apparently. <laughs> it's a very curious thing. I, mean, I find it almost a teaser, I don't know. But it does mean that, and everybody agrees. And this is the uh, phoneticism of uh, Lu Fa Yen and it is converted into a phonologism uh, explicitly because, in fact, it is, of course, it's a very honest, <laughs> honestly done, see? But you can't, at the same time, say, uh, replace a phonetic analysis with a uh, phonemic one uh, and say that you are just transcribing what the other guy is doing. Um, so uh, we have jism, you see, which, of course, is <coughs> what um, uh, Lu Fa Yen would transcribe uh, the word Jizen for. And uh, standard Russian orthography is phonemic here <coughs> and follows a different strategy, which has fine, but certainly, which is very fine, but certainly not a transcription of their early sources. So, uh, Lu Fa Yen would definitely transcribe Jit to live as Rich. 
because that is how it is pronounced. Uh, you have to have uh, uh, some operation in your throat to say, I can't do it. <laughs> if you are down there, you know, you want to say, you are very clearly saying before you have said good morning. So that is my, um, so rhyme then, which is uh, taken by Bill to be the, uh, one of the important arguments for transcribing them as the same. It goes nowhere to prove um, phonetic identity or closeness. And it's very obvious, not very comfortable to remind you of that, but it's very clear. And in any case, I have to say that Lu Fa Yen knew this and, uh, uh, and Bill and <laughs> Laurent, as I see it, uh, didn't, do not uh, quite realize that this is not an argument, you see, and that if they are going to transcribe uh, Lu Fa Yen's uh, effort, uh, then they must transcribe uh, his phonetic and not. Uh, they must transcribe this as zhuj and not as zhij, <laughs> which is what they do. So that's uh, how I take it. In Middle Chinese, we have one phoneme A with three allophones, and we have one E which, uh, with three allophones, and one uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, two allophones, and so on, and all this is. Um, of course, raises this question uh, everywhere. Uh, we are told in, uh, on page, I don't, we, we have it here. We are told that um, uh, the in, about the inadequacies of Cargren's phonological reconstruction, which made it difficult to identify patterns involved. I think I want to go quickly over this um, let me just <laughs> remind you that uh, Karin uh, never um, used the word term uh, chronology in the uh, in the Tibetan sense, except to malign uh, and to, in fact, reject grotesque with grotesque enmity all manner of phonology. He was an anti-phonologist of the first order. And my dear teacher, uh, uh, Sir Egerwood, uh, had his thesis not uh, actually not examined by Cargren because in his thesis he mentioned the word phoneme. That is the story as <laughs> Egerwood had it. So there is no such thing, and the word phonology, <laughs> used before the prince uh, Trubetskoy, uh, does not refer to <laughs> Trubetskoy phonology. So it is true enough that uh, Karin wrote a book on phonology, if you like, on phonology chinoise, but it is a grotesque um, a misunderstanding of one of the main features of Cargren's work. And here is uh, Trubetskoy, the prince, uh, whose, whose brother, by the way, I think um, died in, an, in, in a Ferrari accident in, in Paris. So this is a really quite a family. I'm sorry, not uh, relevant. Um, so <clears throat> then I have uh, something to uh, I really think this is not very important about Cargren's phonology, but it is a very major part of the history of the study of Old Chinese, certainly. Um, Old Chinese and Proto-Chinese indistinguishable. It is, it is difficult at this stage to make a meaningful distinction between Old Chinese and Proto-Chinese. This, I believe, is a serious uh, Category confusion. Uh, unlike Indo-European, a real form of speech current on the Eurasian or Anatolian <coughs> grassy steppes a few millennia ago, the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European parent language is not a concrete historical fact. Rather, it is a very recent hypothetical construct or an abstract scheme, a set of formulae from which properties of the extant daughter languages can hopefully be derived more or less successfully. 
to say that these are hard to distinguish is, is unfortunate if this is the right interpretation. But of course it may not be the right interpretation. So I go on first to say very clearly that Louis Jelms Leo on Kringsprau-Theorien's Grundlegelse, also known as Prolegomena, <laughs> and both are equally unreadable. I do not <laughs> recommend Jelms Leo as <laughs> linguistic prose, uh, neither in Danish nor in English. But he had a very clear vision of this. Uh, Indo-European is, in his terms, a semiotic, and uh, Proto-Indo-European is a metasemiotic. So one thing is a, <laughs> is, a, uh, is a semiotic system, and the other is a description of it. It is about it, and hence the word meta. And so not be able to, to distinguish between these two would be um, to be seriously uh, Categorically at um, Stephen Colvin, my dear friend from across the street, um, says this is a basic category mistake. Old Chinese is an attested cultural artifact, and Proto Chinese a fairly dodgy construct. Um, he put it more uh, well. He is more English than I am. He put it more smoothly than I would have been able to put it. Um, so, perhaps then, the newer English instruction intends Old Chinese here to be used in the narrow technical sense, referred to the earliest stage of Chinese that we can reconstruct from Chinese evidence. That's, you know, that's a possibility. But in that case, we have a plain tautology. The earliest stage of Chinese we can reconstruct for Chinese being defined as being exactly proto-Chinese they would be telling us essentially that they find it difficult to stay at this stage to distinguish between proto-Chinese and proto-Chinese. If that is the, uh, the uh, interpretation, we can discuss this. You know, I, I'm just desperately trying to understand what is, can be meant, right? This cannot be meant. So then, thirdly, what if what they intend is two historical phenomena, one that is attested in the early Chinese texts, and the other imagined as a concrete manifestation of the proto-Chinese system they reconstruct as the common ancestor of all later varieties of Chinese. In this case, now in this case, that does make sense, and if true, it would be important that these two should be, could be shown by compelling evidence to coincide, um, and that is an open uh, it is an issue we can discuss, but I think if that is the meaning, it could have been expressed a little less um, misunderstandably. So, uh, but our early te earliest texts, the oracle bone inscriptions <coughs> dating from the 14th, according to Chu Gui, whatever, I don't care, uh, throw relatively little light <coughs> on matters of phonology, certainly not enough on their, for, uh, on their basis alone to reconstruct phonological system underlying them. For this, we badly need the much later odes. David Keatley puts it in his inimitable, spirited way. He was a journalist. You know, he grew up as a journalist. Uh, the inscriptions tell us so little about their sound that the problem of the pronunciation of Shang graphs has been dis declared near insurmountable. And Takashima yesterday <laughs> concurred. And uh, so uh, there we go to conclude. On this reading, the, uh, the uh, new reconstruction statement would at least make sense. Unfortunately, it would be um, untrue. But at least it makes sense. <laughs> it is just not right. Mm. So, I think uh, I've said some outrageous things and um, displayed enough of my uh, ignorance of phonology for uh, corrections to be in order. Uh, we have, how many minutes do we have for discussion? <laughs>